Are you ready? Uh, I would. Minutes are not there. Welcome everyone. Progress. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining uh, this uh, side event, and uh, I welcome and thanks. Uh, Recording uh, stopped. The advisory uh, and editorial board members, the authors, and uh, also my thanks goes to the production team, uh, the people who have uh, worked uh, very hard behind the scene to bring this uh, to fruition. And uh, we are launching the first issue of for this year under a new leadership uh, of, of a reconstituted uh, advisory board, as well as uh, the newly constituted, constituted editorial board. And uh, we also have gone through uh, some of the uh, challenges and uh, weaknesses uh, of the journals that has been uh, in publication for quite some time now. So uh, we have looked at uh, where you know the niche can be and where where uh, are our strengths, and uh, so the the focus of this journal actually, although the sustainable development in general in the Asia Pacific region, but with a specific emphasis on the countries in a special situations, we call them CSS uh, in short. Uh, that uh, includes uh, LDCs, least developed countries, the landlocked countries, the countries in transitions, especially in, in Central Asia, uh, and they are also landlocked. And the countries, small island country, developing countries, seeds uh, in short, uh, in the Pacific uh, and Indian Ocean. So, uh, this uh, uh, doesn't mean that we will be ignoring uh, bigger countries like India, Indonesia, the emerging economies, uh, but mostly you know, how these, these uh, countries which are in a special situation can learn from the experience of those countries which have uh, progressed uh, in the area of sustainable development. So this, this will be our uh, niche area. And, and keeping that in mind, the editorial board and the advisory board are uh, now uh, con are con they consist of, of the experts from Central Asia uh, and uh, also from uh, the countries that uh, the group of countries that we mentioned. So to keep the, the balance and the focus, uh, we have uh, the, the reconstituted. Uh, the advisory board and the editorial board. The, some of the unique features that we have uh, for this journal is it is a very policy oriented journal. So we're not, we are not uh, after the, the, the mathematical modeling and heavy econometrics. They are they are fine, but that should not be the the focus. So um, if the, if that modeling or or econometric exercise can bring out uh, clearly uh, feasible policy uh, implications, then they'll be most welcome. Uh, but they can have those uh, 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 modeling exercises as a background uh, in the appendix and, and essential part of that. But in the, the main body of the articles should be more focused on policies uh, discussion. So this is our one main feature. The other feature that we thought, you know, coming from the UN, uh, the, we have the in the in the UN the responsibility uh, for capacity building support, especially the authors from the, the group of countries that we mentioned. Uh, they uh, do not uh, uh, get uh, easy access to traditional um, academic journals. Uh, and this is a kind of vicious circles you don't get in and so you don't get the training and then and because you uh, you, you you don't know, know the, the proper style and writing and all these things um, uh, how to uh, for sharpen the analysis so we'll provide that support to early career researchers that is also a unique feature 
The third unique feature of this NOP is it draws from that policy orientation of the journal that we will have uh, the policy makers corners or policy dialogues. Uh, the, the, the policy makers uh, can share their experiences uh, through this platform. And uh, this is a very important thing for us, especially you know, uh, uh, for, for organizations like UN. Uh, which wants uh, uh, to see the, res the results uh, on the ground. Uh, and uh, so these are the three main features of the journals compared to if you, if you compare the journal with any uh, academic journal. So we are not trying to mimic uh, as such, uh, but it doesn't mean that we are will be compromising the, the, the quality. So the journals will still follow the blind uh, referring process, at least two uh, reviewers. Uh, so uh, the members of the editorial boards uh, are encouraged uh, to uh, be more active in this, uh, if they can, uh, to review or to at least uh, try to help us find uh, reviewers uh, for the papers that we receive. Uh, we have a very good flow of papers coming, uh, uh, so that is a good thing. And um, uh, so, so obviously, not all papers will be put to a reviewing post process, uh, so there will be you no know, tax uh, at the desk review uh, before we, we do that, and which basically uh, the job of the, uh, the, the managing editor that uh, I am here and I, with the help of uh, the the core editorial board that uh, SCAP has. So the editorial board is a mix of um, SCAP uh, specialists uh, in various areas, plus uh, academics and researchers from outside. So this is how we, we compose the editorial board. So, uh, and uh, so I, without further ado, I, I invite the presenters today. So the, the, the format of this program, this event, side event is we have uh, two members of the advisory boards and, and Dr. Professor Ann Booth and Dr. Roman um, uh, Mogilevsky from Central Asia and Ann Booth is from uh, uh, joining from uh, London. She's in, in, in uh, Suez. So uh, they are the you know, member of the advisory board. So they will introduce, uh, uh, into make introductory remarks, and then we'll invite uh, one of the authors, uh, the two authors uh, in here, and then uh, actually three authors, uh, yeah, yeah two authors um, will be inviting uh, to speak on the uh, papers that they have, and then one policymakers will invite uh, to share uh, his uh, experience. So uh, let me invite uh, Professor N. Booth. Uh, Professor N. Booth is from, as I said, uh, from uh, University of London, uh, School of uh, uh, Oriental and African Studies, Swiss. Uh, and it's for this year, you've got about five to six minutes to, uh, to uh, say a few words about the journal and how you'd like it to uh, develop. Thanks very much. Um, I think I'm unmuted now, so you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fine, yes. And we can well, see like you as well. Off, obviously, by congratulating you all, um, I think... Uh, this is an unusual journal in that it's not a new journal. Uh, it was, in fact, I think, a, a decision was taken by ESCAP to amalgamate two existing journals, uh, one that I think had a focus on population studies and the other on more general sustainable development issues. Uh, and uh, I think a, a much more interesting journal will probably uh, eventuate. I haven't actually seen um, the first uh, issue yet, but uh, I very much like the policy emphasis uh, because I do think that's important, and it's important particularly for students. I know I've been involved in several regional courses at SOAS. We teach courses on uh, the Asia-Pacific region, but also more specifically on Southeast Asia. Uh, and the students who do these courses often have a very strong interest in uh, uh, 
particular policy issues. Needless to say, at the moment, of course, they're interested in issues relating to climate change, mm -hmm. deforestation, uh, and how these sort of feed into the uh, sustainable development issues. Um, and as we all know, these issues aren't going to go away. In fact, they're going to become uh, more and more important. Uh, earlier, I think uh, Anis was talking about the results of the Australian general election. I thought it was very interesting that in a way, I think now the voters are ahead of the politicians in Australia. Uh, they're much more concerned about climate change issues. Uh, and uh, whereas the politicians have tended uh, in, all, in both of the major parties, I think they've tended to sort of put these issues in the too hard basket. But certainly I think young people everywhere in the world, certainly whenever I travel, I get the impression it's young people who are really concerned about these issues and about, and I think they appreciate the difficult policy choices that their generation is going to have to make. Uh, so I think a journal that really focuses on this in the Asia Pacific region, uh, will be tremendously important. And I think ESCAP have a real opportunity here uh, to push a journal um, that looks at these issues. I would like also um, to uh, argue strongly for making the journal open access to as many uh, students in particular uh, as possible. Uh, I know libraries in Asia, like libraries in many other parts of the world, uh, often have tight budget constraints. Uh, it's very often the case that if you want to get a new journal, uh, if a librarian wants to push a subscription for a new journal, uh, then uh, an existing subscription has to be cut, which is a great pity in a way, uh, but budgets are tight. They're tight, uh, I think, just about everywhere. And so trying to make as much academic publishing as possible, open access, I think, really does help this. And in a way, I think uh, academics still haven't fully exploited the huge potential of the internet uh, when it comes to disseminating uh, academic mm -hmm. research. Many, of course, universities, think tanks and so on put their working papers out uh, now on the internet uh, before they get uh, to final publication stage. And I think that's a tremendous advance. I must say one of the few advantages of lockdown here in London uh, was that I did have time uh, to really start exploring websites in many parts mm -hmm. of the world. Uh, and I am impressed at how good they are and how uh, now I think academics, uh, think tanks, they're making a real effort to get material, particularly policy-related material, uh, out as soon as possible. The problem, of course, is that often there's not much in the way of refereeing. Um, and, of course, the mm. argument from refereed journals is, well, uh, you know, academics expect us now to make more and more material available uh, on an open access ba basis, but we've got to pay uh, for the publication costs, which increasingly, I think, now uh, includes refereeing costs. Uh, I know every journal uh, that I've had anything to do with over the last, what, almost 40 years now, uh, the editors will say, well, the most difficult part of the job is to find good referees, get them to put in their reports in a timely fashion, uh, and then, of course, make the reports available uh, to uh, the authors, often with some encouraging uh, remarks. And uh, I know that certainly most journals, and I'm sure this will be the, the same, most journals that specialise uh, on Asia and indeed other parts of the developing world as well, they do try and encourage particularly younger authors uh, to write in English. It's often difficult for them. English may is usually their second, often their third language. Um, and I know editors do try to get what they think is an interesting paper uh, edited so that the English is clear uh, and reasonably precise. Uh, and I have no doubt at all that Anis and his team will do their best. Uh, but I think we also have to think, as it were, about the other end of the uh, production cycle, making the material available as quickly as possible to as many as possible, particularly younger researchers and indeed students. 
Uh, and here I think, um, as I say, the potential of the internet now is huge. Uh, and I think, uh, we, no, we, we need to have the time and you have to wrap up kindly if you don't mind. Fine. Well, that's really all I've got to say. First of all, uh, congratulations to the team. Uh, I think the focus of the journal, uh, looking at both demographic and sustainable development issues, is very, very timely. I like the policy orientation. But do try to make uh, as many of the articles as possible freely available uh, through the internet. Uh, and that, I think, will particularly benefit uh, students across yeah. the Asia-Pacific region. Yeah, that is the case at the moment. Uh, and uh, you, you, can ex you can download each of the individual articles uh, from the internet. So that is the case. And thank you for all this advice that you, you gave us. Um, uh, we are. We'll take all this on board uh, as we as we proceed. And uh, let me now uh, invite the, our next speaker, Dr. Roman uh, Mogilinski, uh, in from the Institute of Public Policy and Administration, University of Central Asia in Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much, uh, dear distinguished panelists and participants of the event, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, greetings from Bishkek, Kyrgyz Republic. It is my great pleasure to welcome you at the launch of the Asia Pacific Sustainable Development Journal. It is a really good news that UNSCAP decided to relaunch the journal, and it seems that our dynamic and diverse part of the world needs a journal on the, on the contemporary issues of sustainable development. The planned focus on multidisciplinary, policy-relevant, and rigorous research covering country groups with challenging development situations should meet demands of different groups of stakeholders, including academia, governments, civil society organizations. The journal is expected to make a very useful addition to the knowledge on my region of North and Central Asia, concentrating countries with post-socialist transition experience and specific issues related to that, including landlocked location. Two last years have been very difficult for this region, which suffer, suffered from the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, excess mortality indicators were among the highest in the world in, our, in some of these countries. The region suffered from economic slowdown or recession, increasing social inequality, and unfortunately, military conflicts and civil unrest. In such situation, it is very important for the researchers and development professionals to come with a clear, sober, convincing messaging on the key sustainable development issues and solutions as applied to this region. Uh, the policy dialogue in the region is in a great need of evidence and analysis, strengthening our understanding of the ways to achieve peace, human development, climate change mitigation and adaptation, food security, and the eradication of, of all forms of inequality. It is also very important to better position the economies of North and Central Asia as an integral part of, of Asia and Pacific and to strengthen mutual knowledge and understanding of the development context, issues, and available solutions. I would kindly invite researchers from our region to be very active in submitting articles, reading, and citing this variable source. And may I also encourage young researchers from, jury, from the region to effectively contribute to this journal and make their work relevant to the Asian development community. I would like to wish the journal a great success and long life as a unique source of analysis and data on sustainable development in Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your very encouraging words and, and supporting this uh, work. I, can I uh, request uh, the participants, uh, because we did not require you to register in the chat box, if you could kindly uh, give the very ba you know, some basic information about you are, who you are, which uh, institution you're affiliated uh, with, and your email contact. So in the future, we'll, we'll keep you uh, uh, posted and so that we can reach out uh, to you whenever there is anything uh, any good news or any exciting news about the journal. So please uh, do uh, uh, write your, uh, your, uh, your contact details uh, in the chat box and uh, one of uh, the, our support staff will, uh, will, uh, will, will, will copy that and, uh, and maintain a database. 
if you if you don't want, I mean, that's fine. But this is just a request. So let me now in, invite our uh, our author, Valerie. Uh, she is in with the IMF, and um, the she is the lead author of the special issue theme is, uh, we had in this uh, issue, uh, which is the uh, inclusive growth and uh, and sustainable development. The valor is, is, is floor is yours. You got about ten to fifteen, ten to twelve minutes to present uh, the basic findings of your paper. Yes, thank you. Uh, hopefully, you can see the presentation. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, well, thank you again for inviting me to this uh, launch of this new issue of the Asia Pacific Sustainable Development Journal. Um, and as the title mentions, I'm going to discuss a comprehensive and integrated framework for sustainable growth in Asia and Pacific region. Um, and please do note the disclaimer that this reflects my views and not necessarily those of the IMF. Uh, okay, well, to start with, economic growth is still very important. It's important for lifting people out of poverty and contributing to better living standards. But an individual's well-being is increasingly affected by the economic status within their country. And a stark inequality across Asia and the Pacific and within countries of the region creates vast differences in living conditions and millions still remain in poverty. As shown here in this map by the red and orange colors, uh, within country inequality has been rising in many advanced countries and several large emerging market economies between the 1990s and, and 2010s. Um, notably, you see China, India, Indonesia, and the Russian Federation among those with the highest increase in inequality. Uh, you may want to mute yourself. I'm, okay. Yeah. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and amplified these existing inequalities, and it's also threatened economic and social scarring. Uh, for example, recent IMF forecasts of GDP show that advanced economies appear to be bouncing back from the pandemic in terms of output but emerging and developing economies are projected to have substantially lower GDP in the next several years relative to the pre-pandemic forecasts. And past research shows that economic losses are correlated with the rise in inequality, and in turn, higher inequality can also exacerbate poverty traps and social immobility. In addition, the pandemic and the policy response to it led to projected increases in public debt levels, well, for all country groups, but here looking on the right chart, uh, for emerging and middle-income Asia, the rise in projected debt averages between about five and eight percentage points. So this reduces fiscal space for dealing with future challenges and increases the risk of debt distress. Well, economic well-being, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability are interdependent and they're fundamental to sustainable development. And in keeping with this point, we have the, these 17 sustainable development goals. But it's a list of separate goals. An inclusive growth framework is needed to provide a systematic analysis of the interlinkages and to design appropriate policies. So an inclusive growth framework draws on a standard economic model of an economy. We can think of a production function with inputs from both the private sector and the government. In fact, a large share of growth and inequality is determined by private sector activities and in turn by the policies that affect the private sector. So for example, private individuals and firms produce goods and services and they earn income on their labor capital and technology. And these inputs can be derived either domestically or through globalization which is adding labor capital and technology through migration, capital flows, 
and technology transfers across borders. And of course, marketplaces must be fair and competitive and have level playing fields, both domestically and internationally. So they need to ensure appropriate prices and opportunities for all to contribute and reap the outputs of trade and production. Now, we naturally think of direct government interventions that impact growth and inclusion. Government initiatives for developing and distributing vaccines and health services more generally have been at the top of our minds during the pandemic. And the government also delivers public education infrastructure and uses macro stabilization policies to smooth economic fluctuations. It uses tax and spending instruments to redistribute income so as to increase the welfare of the very poorest and reduce income disparities. But beyond that, the institutions of the state establish the rules of the game and legal protections, as well as a political environment conducive to enacting efficient, inclusive, and sustainable reform. While the private sector and government jointly generate economic activity and affect its distribution, and inclusivity can be considered along various dimensions, such as gender, age, and other personal attributes, as well as across regions in a country. Economic benefits, including resource wealth, need to be shared across current and future generations. And inclusive growth must be sustainable. So policies to address climate change are fundamental to sustaining growth and ensuring equity for both current and future generations. And inclusive growth is also dynamic. For example, the final distribution of income provides opportunities to accumulate human and physical capital and promote entrepreneurship. So as you see, inclusive and sustainable growth is multidimensional and requires a whole of society approach for progress. So this framework can be applied to assess policy options for countries in Asia and the Pacific. So in the interest of time, let me just focus on a few key challenges for the region uh, in terms of both inclusion and sustainable growth. Well, labor market informality uh, accounts for at least half of the labor force in the Asian region and nearly 90% in South Asia. Informal jobs usually lack the benefits and protections of formal work. Private entities can create mutually beneficial agreements and solutions on benefits, working conditions, family leave and programs for enhancing skills. The government, in turn, can use tax, legal, and regulatory powers to set standards and provide supporting program. Gender disparities persist across the spectrum of labor market indicators. Uh, I think someone is still is unmuted. So I hear some background noise. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so as you see, the gender disparities are persisting across many countries in the region. Um, to begin with, labor force participation of women is significantly below that of men and wages and earnings are far from parities. And these gaps translate into higher inequality and poverty for women. So a range of policies is required to address these disparities from changing laws that discriminate against women, enforcing laws against violence and child marriage, ensuring female education and health, reducing high marginal taxes on second earners, and other labor market policies to support women in the workforce. But how many slides you have left? Uh, just a couple more. Yeah, yeah, if you could, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go yeah. yeah. Uh, so another challenge is on financial development inclusion. Um, this ensures people have access to savings vehicles and can borrow to invest in physical and human capital. Um, and uh, 
we see that in the region, there's still gaps here. For example, five countries in Asia account for about 40% of global unbanked population. Technology is another aspect that's a force that drives prosperity, but it might also create inequality. In fact, you see for these three countries uh, that um, wages have remained far below technologically driven rise in productivity. And some fear that this could exclude developing countries from participating in some of the gains and lead to premature industrialization. Uh, two, two more points to make. Um, first is on global integration related to trade and cross-border capital and labor flows. That's a theme that's likely can, to continue. And on in, this issue, I want to mention that the preponderance of evidence suggests that trade is beneficial to inclusive growth. As in other regions, countries in Asia and the Pacific, which increased trade as a share of GDP, over the past several decades have also experienced a higher rate of economic growth. Moreover, the impact on inequality, although it varies by country, on average research shows that that's typically, trade has typically favored the poor in developing countries and it has other benefits such as reducing prices. And lastly, uh, for some countries in the region and especially South Asia, they're highly vulnerable to climate change. So addressing this is going to require, well, first of all, global efforts at mitigation, and, but even mitigation for uh, countries that aren't the main mitigators, it has some co-benefits such as reducing air pollution and associated health problems. And for all affected countries, it is gonna require substantial adaptation investments to cope with these impacts as well as incentives for green innovation and transition to green energy sources. So those are some of the, the themes that I would highlight in the application of this inclusive growth framework to countries in the region. And uh, I'll stop here and I'm happy to discuss further. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll pass it on uh, now. I'll pass it the floor back. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I was I was muted. Sorry, sorry. So, <laughs> um, yeah, this is the problem with the technology. Very. Thank you for your presentation. And you will stopped at where the the next presentation will begin. That is the climate change variability and its impact on food security in the region. And I invite now Professor Huda and his team to present uh, the key findings of their paper. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, we can hear you. I can see you. We can slides. hear you, and we can also see your slides. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity um, on this and that very, as you mentioned, connecting what Dr. Valery said has presented about the climate uh, vulnerability. Uh, the, our paper is on impact of climate change and variability on food security in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the authors, Dr. Ashish Mukherjee, he is just now meeting with the Agricultural State Minister of West Bengal, India, so he couldn't come here. Um, so he's from Bidhan Chandra Agriculture University in West Bengal, but we do have the second author, uh, Dr. Sholil Shah in the group. Uh, he's from Uttar Bangla Agriculture University in West Bengal again. And also we have a third author, Stephen Laliat uh, in the audience. And he is formerly uh, director of Bureau of Metrology of Australia and New South Wales. And I am from Western Sydney University and uh, from School of Science. Okay, the paper um, outlines that is a highly varying geography in the Asia Pacific, highly disaster prone, high climate variability, 
and leads to variable food production. And it is accelerated by the climate change and extreme climatic events. So we reviewed in the paper the recent past and projected future climate and the impacts on food security. We also recommend a climate smart agricultural practices locally and at scale for the sustainable development goals and future food security. Unpredictable rainfall due to climate variability is impacting farmers globally. In developing countries, particularly farmers face a double whammy due to additional problem of the knowledge and techniques uh, that help integrate climate soil information. And that leads to unconstrained crop losses and increased poverty. Now, this is the FAO um, scheme of the climate change impact on food security. Um, we have focused mostly on the availability side and, of course, on the stability side of the whole scheme of agroecosystem, agricultural production, and the climate impact aspects. That's our background and that's our expertise, the team that we have. Uh, future production side, there's overall growing consensus that there will be a decline in yields by mid to late 21st century, unless, as the previous speakers mentioned, uh, extensive adaptive and mitigative actions are taken. Otherwise, there will be substantial threat to global food security, and thus further assessment of yield expectations for all agricultural outputs required to discern the relative merits of investments. Now from the paper that has just come out today, I believe um, we've seen that the PDF version, um, we reviewed uh, mainly some principal crop three here, rice, wheat, and maize. We won't go in details just to mention that there are certain areas where the climate change may lead to positive impact, like we've shown here in Pakistan, for example, for wheat. But also another point we mentioned, very critically, the management, how important the management is. So if you look into the wheat yield change here in this graph, India's irrigation versus if we don't have irrigation facilities, limited irrigation the impact will be more. Those are the kind of points. And then you have seen different regions in the Asia Pacific countries. The coping strategies include the reforms and restructuring of agriculture, supporting infrastructure relationships, noting climate change and sustainable development are all linked. Top down approaches like IPCC and Agenda for Sustainable Development Goal, yes, they are very useful, but not sufficient. So, direct Adaptive measures to boost agricultural productivity are required. So we recommend a suite of climate smart agricultural practices, uh, bottom up or at scale are proposed. Again, I saw this, uh, this kind of slides seen everywhere, but the point to make here that agriculture, food security is linked with almost all of the sustainable goals. In our case, we want to emphasize the number five, the gender equality, like we showed, we'll show some work that we're doing, how we have empowered women farmers in many parts of the world, particularly it's an Indian case, with example that we show. New agroclimatic risk and opportunity management framework to deliver climate smart agriculture developed by us at the Western Sydney University to design, to enhance sustainable farming practices that improve um, food security through agricultural diversification and it has empowered and empowers farmers, researchers, and agribusiness in many countries. This is the framework I'd like to share. I know don't want to go to the details. All I'm saying that our research focuses on agroclimatic aspects, just not climate, but crops and soils, management, all of that, and climate variability, climate change, seasonal climate forecast, what's going to happen in the next three weeks, two months, and alternative farming systems, include vegetables, fruits, fish, profitability through agribusiness, value chain, marketing, women participation. And most importantly, we work particularly in the rainfall areas, which is very important to match the crop period with water period. 
And then, of course, resource use efficiency, there's nutrition, pests management, all those different projects that we use and address the enhanced food production issues, not only the production side, but quality and the productivity. And in doing so, we have been working through holistic natural resource management for sustainable agriculture and improving livelihood. Farmers, of course, the policy implementation is very important, as was mentioned by Dr. Professor Chaudhary in the beginning of the policy issues. The climate, just a couple of examples that you want to show the kind of research we've done and integrated pest management, for example, by Buddha et al. So we on the in, funded by the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research, Japan based. So let leaf spot in peanuts for India and Cambodia, for example, alternative blight in mustard for India and Bangladesh, sclerotinia and acanola for Australia and India. And this enabled identification of critical, critical climate-related decisions between uh, information adaptation and mitigation strategies. Now, another project, uh, again, uh, led by myself and uh, funded by Asia Pacific Network of Global Change Research, found that 10 to 15% reduction in rainy season crop yields and 20 to 25% reduction in post rainy season crops in India. So breeding of wheat, heat tolerant wheat and chickpea varieties needed to be strengthened. And for example, in China, increasing temperatures favor wheat maize systems in the north. We did work in China and India and Australia for this project. Rice-based systems in the south are disadvantaged. Maize varieties with a longer growing season for northern China uh, is required to overcome this deficiency. The Chinese government established a disaster fund to deal with extreme weather events. And research should concentrate on practicing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and water used by rice. This is what one of our recommendations are by biological nitrogen fixation for soil health issues. Professor Huda, <laughs> if you could kindly, within a minute, uh, wrap up. Okay, so yeah, we'll take 10 minutes, as you said. Um, so we completed about 24 projects, which currently were well, three major projects we're working in, and that includes in Qatar and also in the Pacific Island countries, very important, uh, funded by the European uh, agencies. New Caledonia, Fiji, Vanuatu, and Solomon Islands, sustainable fatigation for yield and quality. Now, one of the projects that we're just finishing up on the climate smart agriculture in action, a multifaceted climate smart livelihood improvement program. We work in two smallholder agriculture based villages, dependence on seasonal monsoon rainfall removed through water management, excess rainfall water normally lost was captured and applied through climate smart practices. We diversified production, rice, chickpea, mushroom, worm cultivation, fish farming, fruit tree, um, and range of sustainable agricultural practices. The outcomes include diversified year-round agricultural production, increase in profitability, movement from subsistence farming to fledgling small commercial farms, improved diets for blitz, and increase the labor market participation of women. We have a summary videos listed here, eight minutes video, if you want to see that at some point in time. The scoping, designing, implementation requires transdisciplinary collaboration of experts, governments, and producers. Also calls for international collaboration to capture best practices. Uh, some other work like Cray et al. 2022 suggested that three degree global temperature, what will happen in Africa? So the existing situation that technologies can be took from other places. This is the last one, last slide. Opportunistic uptake can change livelihoods for individual producers. Optimizing benefits for the Asia Pacific region requires coordinated planning, implementation, investment, scales from state to nations and broader regional areas, each customized to suit their particular circumstances. Special attention to enabling small whole farming communities, underpinning infrastructure, capacity building and finance, complement with assistance opening and servicing new markets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Huda and your team for uh, presenting your uh, research work uh, to our forum. And now I invite uh, uh, Professor Bambang Budjirono, uh, former uh, Minister of the Republic of Indonesia. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah we you. can see you and hear you also. Okay, thank you, Anis. Uh, Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all distinguished speakers, authors, and also participants. 
And first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, UNS Cup for launching this uh, Asia Pacific Sustainable Development Journal, as well as uh, thank you to Dr. Anis as editor, who invited me to be part of the first edition of the journal. Of course, my capacity uh, as author, more as uh, from my past experience as Minister of Development Planning, dealing with the SDGs. So if I can uh, uh, get my uh, presentation, is somebody uh, going to get my presentation? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, when I was appointed as Minister of Development Planning in 2016, one of my first job is to so-called translate SDGs from global action into national priorities. And of course, the way to uh, translate the SDGs into Indonesia perspective is by mainstreaming SDGs in development policy, development action in Indonesia. And certainly, at the time, uh, we have been able to produce presidential degree that uh, supports the implementation of SDGs in Indonesia, as well as understanding about the goal in 2030. Uh, as some of you might know, Indonesia still adopts the development planning, five years medium-term development planning, and uh, we have included SDGs in our development planning, even since uh, medium term plan 2015, 2019, and then continued with 2020, 2024. So hopefully by having these SDGs as a mainstream in our development policy, then Indonesia can you know, achieve the SDGs 2030, maybe not in the all goals, but maybe few goals. And if you look at what happened today, based on Sustainable Development Report 2021, of 17 goals of SDGs in Indonesia, three of them already on track to be achieved in 2030. And those are the one with the green arrow, goal number four, about quality of education, goal number six, clean water and sanitation, as well as goal number eight, decent work and economic growth. But then, our concern is not, on, is not on those three, but more on the five goals that still stagnating. Those five goals, most of them related to the issue of environmental and climate change. For example, goal number 11 about sustainable cities and communities, because we still have, I think, quite significant popul urban population living in slum area, for example, and then they don't have enough access for uh, improve water, uh, clean water, as well as uh, other basic infrastructure. Goal number 13, climate action. Of course, this will depend on our effort to reduce the emission, especially from forest and land use sector. And then for life below water, our score, Indonesian score, are still below the standard. And then uh, only 26% of marine sites is protected. And then goal number 15, life on land, uh, depends on our effort to, de to decrease deforestation. We have been able to decrease deforestation. We have been able to implement the moratorium of palm oil. But of course, uh, still a challenge to reduce the potential uh, emission coming from the land. And then, unfortunately, there is also goal number 17, partnership for goals, meaning that so far, at least until 2021, most of the SDGs effort still done majority by the government. It means uh, we, have, we have not been able as an Indonesian government to attract private sector as well as other communities to participate in achieving SDGs goal. So of course, when we are talking about achieving the goals, it's not only the program, we need the financing. And uh, on the next slide, we can see that originally the needs to fulfill the SDG school 2030 before pandemic is $2.5 trillion worldwide. But then we know that the pandemic hits us, hit us, and then uh, 
at the same time, there was so-called Caesar effect. Caesar effect on SDG financing happens when potential resources decrease while the needs increase. The increase of needs, of course, coming from the health related issues because we have to deal with this global pandemic. And we know at the beginning that human being is not really prepared to face the COVID-19. On the demand side, on the, sorry, on the resources side, then we can see that there is a need to increase the spending for the health. So as a result, there is a $1.7 trillion additional SDGs financing needed. And of course, it cannot come only from public sector. Public sector has limitation and we don't want the global financial situation is trapped into the global debt because of the effort to increase the resources of SDGs financing. So alternatively, we have to invite private sector. And of course, now we have to invite private sector even in the bigger term. So the question, how can we get more resources? Because from the uh, public and also uh, related to the private side, we can see there is a drop of portfolio investment during the, during the pandemic. Also drop in FDI. I mean, both of them, of course, closely related to private sector and also drop in remittance flows. So it has to be a way to find new resources. Of course, we hope that portfolio investment, FDI and remittance will be improving. But then uh, we need to find new uh, alternative that is called the philanthropy or we have to make it as SDGs, blended financing. On the next page, please. So uh, blended finance, I believe now becomes even uh, more urgent than ever. I mean, uh, prior to pandemic, people might uh, discuss about blended finance, but they think maybe this is only optional. But then now, because of the pandemic, because of the increasing needs to uh, fulfill the gap of SDGs financing, blended finance becomes a must rather than an option. And of course, we also have to apply the concept no one left behind, not only for SDGs beneficiaries, but for also for SDGs actors. And those actors coming from private sector, coming from philanthropy, but the idea is to mix the source, the, the different sources of financing. For example, from public and philanthropy, we can create development funding that is concessional, but development funding can also be mobilized from private capital. So why, by combining development funding and private capi capital, hopefully we can come up with the blended finance structures with relatively low cost of financing. And uh, that could be done through existing instruments, either through uh, equity shares, through the bonds, government bonds or uh, corporate bonds, as well as the grant, grant from public or philanthropic funders, and also uh, efforts that have been done by uh, some uh, big players in philanthropy, including some uh, big foundations. And then uh, we can also witness that there has been an uh, additional use of blended finance in different sectors to respond to this SDGs uh, financing. The biggest one would be in energy sectors, followed by financial services and agriculture. So those three sectors basically are ready to implement blended financing in their daily operation and their uh, daily uh, businesses. On the next page, uh, I would like to show you the examples of blended financing that has been implemented in Indonesia. The first one is development and revitalization of micro hydropower plant in Jambi, a province in uh, Sumatra Island in Indonesia. The idea is to provide a uh, hydropower plant, micro hydropower plant for villages that never had electricity at the time uh, for se after 70 years of Indonesian independence. So finally, they got electricity, but the electricity not come only from uh, public money from the budget, but instead it becomes a blended financing with the source from 
partly from public money, from the budget, from the Ministry of Energy, and also from international uh, grant or support from UNDP, as well as, and this is very interesting, for from Islamic social finance from Zakat, uh, organized by Indonesian Zakat Agency, as well as support from international uh, financing through global environmental uh, financing or GEF, uh, supported by... Bang, bang. I mean, how many slides left? Uh, if you could, uh, uh, kindly is, uh, them. Uh, uh, only uh, the last two, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, with that, uh, we can provide the electricity. And of course, it will help a lot on the implementation of SDGs number one, three, four, seven, eight, and 13. The other example is partnership for Indonesia Sustainable Agriculture. That's also a combination from private and public sector in which we are trying to empower the farmers by linking them with uh, financial sectors, including cooperative institution, and trying to make the ecosystem, the supply chain, that will uh, create the direct linkage between the farmers and food industry. So at the end, the farmers can sell more their, uh, you know, their, pros their uh, prosperity has been better. And of course, uh, the production of agriculture itself has been increasing. Last but not least, on the next slide, uh, there is another example on how one goal of SDGs related to the others. So we don't have to treat the 17 goals separately. Instead, we have to make the combination of the 17. One of the examples that has been done in Indonesia is the national effort to reduce the stunting, in which in the past, stunting only considered as minister, Ministry of Health's job, especially on the specific intervention like providing nutrition, providing medicine, vitamin, and also immunization. But then we realized that that's not enough. It has to be accompanied by sensitive intervention through infrastructure like clean water and sanitation, non cash food assistance, especially for low-income family, and also national health insurance to ensure their, uh, their healthy uh, situation as well as early childhood education to make sure the children can be out of the study. So by doing this, by trying to get together different ministries to deal with the study issues, we hope that Indonesia can achieve uh, the stunting reduction less than 20% by 2024. So I think that would be my uh, contribution not only to the to the journal, but hopefully to to be shared with uh, other policymakers everywhere in the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Anis. Yeah, thank you, Pa Bang Bang, uh, Professor Bang Bang, for your excellent presentation. I now uh, hand over uh, to our uh, chief editor, who is the executive secretary of uh, UNSCAP and the secretary general, United Nations, uh, Army, uh, Professor Armida Alice Jabana. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Pa Anis. A very good afternoon to all colleagues. Uh, again, we just heard these several presentations uh, from uh, the the what contributor, yeah, that that uh, gives uh, the the, the uh, new look, yeah, and also in terms of substance, which is more policy oriented, uh, the kind of issues being. Uh, capture in the new reconstituted journal. Yes, yeah, so for that, I would like to first of all uh, take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the journal's managing editor, Pa Anis, advisory board members, uh, I know uh, Anne and Dr. Roman Mongilevsky joined earlier, uh, and of, of course also all advisory board members, uh, resource persons that have contributed yeah, uh, to this event as well as in our various discussion uh, to uh, the new, uh, I think, editor board 
uh, members yeah that also uh, just join yeah in starting in this particular issue i again receive feedback and we are uh, implementing this yeah uh, especially feedback from our advisory board members on the important role of uh, the journal especially in enabling researchers scholars development practitioners to share their research findings and insight that will enrich dialogue yeah, the policy dialogue uh, with the evidence based policy making especially to advance uh, sustainable development in our region and in in particular yeah in particular we would like to encourage researchers policy makers from the so called css country with special situation namely ldcs or least developed countries landlocked developing countries as well as small island developing states or sits yeah in particular we would like to encourage more your contribution and as you know just quickly maybe pa anis already touch on this yeah uh, in his uh, opening remarks or introductory remarks that this journal is uh, actually uh, previously uh, were two separate journal uh, the first one is uh, again asia pacific development journal established 1986 and Asia Pacific Population Journal established in 1994 and then we merged this two journal uh, about four years ago 2018 to become the Asia Pacific Sustainable Development Journal and why yeah because we are very much yeah uh, supporting the implementation of SDGs uh, as well as sustainable development or SDG itself is um uh, multidisciplinary multidisciplinary uh, concept yeah it's not only population it's not only uh, of course development but uh, a little bit more focus yeah on the three pillar of sustainable development yeah the pillar of economic social and environmental challenges yeah so therefore we would like to dedicate a quite focus yeah on uh, advancing sustainable development especially agenda 2030 we constituted a new advisory board and editor board uh, as well as revise editorial policies with a view to further strengthen the scope focus and standard of the journal yeah and again uh, just uh, as a last my last point is uh, the the Uh, content of this uh, particular volume here yeah, uh, sheds light on the more policy oriented focus uh, including again what the name is it the corner or what uh, in which pa bambang contributed the article yeah we again a policy makers corner policy makers uh, pol- policy policy makers corner yeah pa bambang former minister of papenas former minister of finance former minister of research and technology yeah is uh, i think uh, yeah the most uh, uh, suitable person yeah to share uh, the experience on advancing or on sdg implementation with a particular uh, case of indonesia yeah so again uh, i could only say thank you for all your support and looking forward yeah looking forward to future editions of the journal in which all of you good contribute thank you pa anis and uh, back to you thank you ibu uh, and thanks all the participants uh, this is the time i mean unfortunately we don't have unlimited time and uh, i could not uh, take questions uh, for discussions the whole idea is uh, just to um, get to know each other and to know the uh, the orientation of the journals where we are heading and again the thanks to the uh, all the participants and the advisory board and the editorial board and all those people, you know people who are who are involved in the uh, behind the scene in the production of this uh, journal it is already available on online uh, so you can go and uh, uh, and click the, the link and you can download the papers uh, so um, with that uh, 
again, I'm going to request that please uh, uh, circulate uh, the this uh, as much as you can uh, to among your colleagues, uh, so this, uh, that they will get the largest uh, uh, possible uh, exposure, the maximum possible exposure. Our aim is not to sell the journals and make money, as it's, as as Anne mentioned. I mean, our aim is actually to reach out and and uh, and share the the practical experiences and the policy implications uh, of the challenges that we we have we are facing, uh, and increasingly these are very difficult challenges with a global uh, situation becoming more and more uncertain. So uh, we have a mission to achieve, uh, but those who are academically inclined, uh, we, I would like to share uh, one information. The journal is reasonably well ranked uh, according to this uh, Australian the Business Dean's Council. It is a B-ranked journal, uh, so uh, which is uh, quite high up, and uh, uh, we are aiming to get more uh, citations and and. Uh, the other, all the other uh, traditional ranking uh, uh, indicators that we have. Uh, we also know that the ranking indicators are biased against the regional journals, especially coming from developing countries, uh, but nothing much we can do. We we will try uh, to reach out. Our actually, the, the main um, aim is to, is to become more, ep- a usable journal, rather than just look at the uh, at the ranks, which is a very abstract thing. Uh, how many people are uh, using it, and are they getting you know any any, any benefit out of the uh, like, for example, the paper that uh, Professor Huda presented uh, with all the practical examples of how agriculture can be made more climate resilient, and then. Uh, uh, Valerie mentioned about how overall the, the, the policies can be made more inclusive uh, and uh, sustainable growth. And then Professor Bambang, uh, you know, he shared his uh, you know, uh, real experience of dealing with uh, three ministries at the same time. I think he's the most experienced uh, presenters today in terms of implementation of, of uh, policies and so this this will be a good platform for to bring in the academic researchers with the people who have practical experience how we can make our research more applicable more uh, uh, you know, uh, usable uh, and useful for the uh, humanity so with that i again thanks all thank all of you uh, for your uh, participation support and I look forward to your uh, cooperation and support uh, in coming days. And again, my uh, from my bottom of my heart, I would like to thank the production team. I don't want to mention name each and every individual, but uh, please know that uh, you very much in my in my thought, and you have done a tremendous job, uh, even uh, with someone who had. Uh, very um, uh, personal family uh, situation. Uh, they still, you know, uh, cared for the job, and, and and this shows the commitment they have uh, to the uh, well-being of of, of humanity uh, at large. So again, thank you, thank you to everyone. Okay, bye.